Shepard, I'm sorry you were interrupted. Um, by all means, if you want to um, deal with those very last points again, please do. My Lord, I, I was simply making the point that um, the judge's conclusion uh, that there was a, an inaccurate picture presented is um, fully made out by the contemporaneous exchanges. So, for example, at E35, Mr. Fiskin said that he had pushed his client all the way on price. Um, that was an egregious lie because, in fact, um, the price paid by the client was $47 million, uh, uh, which gave Mr. Fiskin an immediate $3 million profit. Uh, and the reason that he um, said that was because he knew that otherwise uh, Mr. Fiskin wouldn't have sold him the car at all. Um, and I gave you the reference at D21. Mr. Fiskin had told my client that he was earning a $500,000 commission from his client. Uh, the fact that um, the, the uh, respondent was acting as an intermediary indeed was his pleaded case. My learned friend makes a number of pleading points, if I can be permitted just to take one. If you go to uh, B73, fairness to him, my lord, this isn't um, learned friend's pleading. Um, you'll see at B73 paragraph 1 at all material times the claimant was and is an intermediary dealing in high-end classic motor cars. So his pleaded case was that he was uh, an intermediary uh, and was maintaining that case through to the issue of the particulars of trade. Um, can I uh, deal next with, uh, very briefly, with the Sale of Goods Act? My Lords, my Lady, whether the Sale of Goods Act applies uh, was an issue at the trial. The judge uh, so says, it's a matter of law. Uh, pleadings do not bind the judge. Uh, Mr. Hooper uh, purported to say a great deal about the product of negotiations. Um, it isn't admissible um, ever since Prennan Simmons to uh, look at negotiations for the purposes of construction, as was confirmed in Chartwood by Lord Holmes. It's a perilous path because I can do the same. I'll just give you the references. E4. E9, E10, E13 uh, are examples of uh, 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 previous drafts of the agreement in which um, there are references to uh, Fiskin acting as agent. Um, my next point is that the drafter knew the difference between delivery <coughs> and turnover. Turnover, by any stretch of the um, uh, uh, very elastic language, the, Eng the English language, does not mean sent to London. Uh, the next point is that as far as the agreement was concerned, uh, in Clause 7, Clause 7.1 records that the seller didn't have possession of the gearbox. Clause 7.2 expressly records in its final sentence that the seller had corresponded with Kanipa regarding the whereabouts of the gearbox, but Kanipa has advised that they have not been able to locate it. Uh, that was the state of play at the date of the making of the contract. So. Um, Kanipa's door had already been firmly knocked on, uh, but answer came not in the positive but in the negative. 
the, there was nothing to suggest uh, that the position as regards Canepa would be any easier than any third party. That indeed, they had already tried but failed to obtain the gearbox from uh, Canepa. And all I say about uh, Clause 7 is that there is no warrant for drawing uh, such a thick black line under Clause 7.6 for essentially two reasons. Uh, first of all, if it had been the intention that Canepa would be subject to a completely different regime, first of all, there would have to be some sensible commercial reason for treating Canepa differently. And try as he may, my learned friend discovered none. Uh, secondly, um, his argument about consideration um, is the sort of a very tortured, highly complicated argument that occurs to lawyers but uh, doesn't really occur uh, in real life. Uh, and perhaps I can add a third, and that is that if one then looks at the regime that follows, nowhere is it suggested that Canepa should be excluded from it. Part of it includes not just locating the gearbox, but bringing proceedings for damages uh, and there being uh, agreements for funding those proceedings uh, up to the tune uh, without consent of 78.1, you'll see, that the seller agrees not to incur more than $100,000 in legal costs without buyer's written consent. And um, uh, there is a provision for uh, the sharing of damages. So um, uh, what I submit is that there's really nothing in the point that um, there was a special regime for uh, Kanipa and for everybody else. Mr. Carl's address. Uh, Mr. Carl's address was what Mr. Carl was asked to provide by Mr. Bending. A London address and he provided it. It isn't his residence. Nobody thought that it was his residence. When Mr. Carl gave his address at the trial, uh, he gave his address in uh, 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 Palm Beach. Uh, the emails, none of the emails, so far as anyone can tell, went to a uh, London address. The emails went back and forth to Washington. The fact that um, uh, there is a London address does not mean that that was Mr. Carl's residence. It doesn't say it's his residence. It simply provides the address. It happened to be one of the many properties that Mr. Carl happens to own. Uh, the cost of making delivery. Um, here, the contract uh, is uh, silent. Uh, it says turnover, not deliver to London if there had been an obligation upon the seller to meet the cost of delivery, it would have so said. Uh, very briefly, on the fee, um, I, I just make three very short points. Uh, first of all, uh, there is nothing to suggest in Clause 7 uh, that there will be no fee, uh, I, I submit, when properly read, that there will be no fee if Canepa does, after all, turn out to be uh, the place where the uh, gearbox is. Uh, and there's no commercial reason why uh, my client's efforts, however extensive they may or may not be, uh, uh, should be excluded. Uh, uh, there is no reason, in answer to my Lord's question, why to distinguish a recalcitrant Canepa from everybody else. Um, and I've already made the point that uh, Canepa had already proved not to be uh, a possible source of, uh, or at least that their door had already been knocked on. Um, so far as breach and termination is concerned, if one looks at the 21st of February emails themselves, 
and they're conveniently set out in the judgment. Um, the Lord one can see how the uh, real concern of Mr. Fiske was that he appreciated that he'd undertaken to pay before inspection. Uh, and what it really boils down to is that he didn't want to take the risk of uh, paying the $500,000 and then finding afterwards that the gearbox was not uh, the right gearbox. Uh, he wanted uh, only to pay $500,000 after he had ascertained uh, 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 the origins of the gearbox. But it, it goes further than that, because what he didn't want to do uh, was to have um, or make arrangements for the inspection of the gearbox at Canepa, uh, 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 but, but instead he wanted to, in effect, rewrite the agreement that he had made so as to um, remove from it the risk that he had otherwise uh, taken on. Uh, on the cross appeal, um, all I need say about that is that um, the judge finds uh, that um, there's no title that um, that the reason that 7.12 is included was, was concern about title to sue. Well, of course, uh, as far as title to sue is concerned, uh, one can't look at this simply in terms of English law. One has to consider that um, Mr. Fisk, Mr. Carl was looking at a situation where he might have to bring proceedings who knows where uh, and establish his uh, right to do so uh, uh, in whatever circumstances and under whatever legal regime might apply. Now, uh, the bill of sale says nothing about the gearbox. Uh, the bill of sale refers entirely uh, to the car itself. And indeed, the obligation to execute the bill of sale uh, is uh, one that's provided for uh, under um, clause uh, 5 of the contract. And the bill of sale itself indeed is, is uh, appended to the agreement. Uh, as far as specific performance is concerned, of course, Melendra likes to celebrate the fact that I wasn't given uh, permission to appeal on specific performance. You'll recall that the reason that the judge um, felt able to grant specific performance and thereby overlook all of the conduct that had gone into persuading my client uh, to part with his car in circumstances where he wouldn't have had he known the true circumstance is because the judge considered that he was barred from doing so by the uh, refusal of Judge Kayser to grant permission to amend the particulars of claim. Now, I wasn't given permission to appeal on that, so I can't move that appeal. Uh, but it is no bar, I submit, and I'll put this um, very shortly, it's no bar to the court considering that in these circumstances it isn't appropriate that the claimant should have permission to appeal. But in a sense, that's really fighting the last war, because the reality is, as has been recognized by the court, that um, the gearbox has now been delivered up. Um, my client is very much interested in uh, the half a million dollars that uh, he has not been paid. Um, as far as the ex-Turpi Causa principle is concerned, uh, I've dealt with that in my skeleton. Uh, I do uh, adhere to those positions uh, and I, I'm not going to develop them further orally. As far as section 9 of the notice of appeal is concerned, my Lord, Lord Justice Richards' question, uh, my Lord, I wonder if I can um, answer it um, by, as it were, not answering it. Uh, and that is to um, beg the indulgence that once the court has considered its judgment and has given judgment, 
that the parties should have um, an opportunity to put in some short written submissions as to what the appropriate order should be, depending on the extent of success or failure of my appeal. Well, for my part, I'm not sure that's good enough. Um, the way the system works is that you are required in section 9 of your appellant's notice to um, tell the court what you're asking it to do. Yes. And um, you, have asked, you have asked us to set aside the order for specific performance. Yes. Um, we might have been under the impression, or I might have been under the impression, that um, this case was really about the $500,000, but it's quite clear that um, that was not Mr. Hooper's understanding, his understanding, and it looks from the pleadings as though he may have a point, is that this case was about the gearbox. And yes. it might therefore, therefore, might therefore be um, a reasonable inference that all you were asking us to do was to set aside the order for specific performance um, and had, uh, as it were, deliberately put all your eggs in that basket. Yes. Well, my lord, let me take the eggs out of that basket. Um, because in the brief um, time available, uh, I, my client has made clear that um, it's not about the gearbox. Um, the gearbox, he's got, uh, as I understand him, uh, his um, primary concern is um, uh, not to obtain return of the gearbox. What he does want to do is to be um, paid the fee that he earned. He is concerned, although this isn't an order that I ask your lordships to make, it, it, it is a fact that my client um, does want to uh, examine the possibility of bringing uh, further proceedings in relation to the $3 million that was earned uh, by Fiskins improperly, he says. Um, but so far as the order is concerned, then can I put um, uh, answer your Lordship's question in this way? That first of all, I would ask your Lordship to allow the appeal uh, uh, as regards all of the grounds of appeal that I had advanced. Secondly, I do not ask your Lordship to set aside the order for specific performance. I do ask your lordships to order that there should be a payment of $500,000 plus interest uh, as a condition of delivery of the gearbox to uh, the respondent. Um, My Lord, I think I think that's probably as far as I need to go. Thank you. So, um, litigation is brought against your client to deliver up the gearbox, during which the court um, goes into the whole transaction, deals with twenty-one issues, or is it twenty-four? issues and um, your client is now saying that he reserved the right to start up all over again after this in well, relation he... to, um, to matters which were dealt with in the proceedings, permission to appeal refused. Whether he's able to or not, the Lord, whether that were judged, whether that would be judged Henderson and Henderson abuse of well, it might be it, it might be something beyond Henderson. Yes. Um, but um, there it is. We're not concerned with that. No. Well, Lord, those are my submissions, unless I can assist further. Thank you very much, Mr. Shepherd. Yes, um, no. Um, there are really two things out there that um, Mr. Shepherd said some pointed to some disobliging things the judge has said about your client in um, the judgment, which you should have an opportunity to briefly answer, bearing in mind we stopped you rather first time round, and anything you want to say in response to the cross appeal. My Lord, yes, and, and dealing with those, um, 
disparaging things about my client. They do um, only really, well, I, I will focus on them in the context of the cross appeal. You have some, you have some competition. Would you mind speaking up? I, I'm sorry, my lord. Um, as regards the disparaging things that were said about GFL, um, my learned friend, as I understand it, primarily relies upon those on the standing to sue issue. Yes. Um, I've set, I, I have set out my submissions in writing on standing to sue in quite some detail. The point about um, my clients allegedly misleading Mr. Carl does not have an impact on the no. construction of well, the document. You may be right about that, but it's not allegedly. The judge has made some findings about that. Um, but I'm just giving you the opportunity, in case there's anything in fairness to your client, that you want to say in response to what was said a moment ago. I'm not inviting you to do so. No, my lord. The findings are in the judgment. Um, my lord has them. One point that I would just pick up as to the gravity of all of this. Yes. Um, when the when Mr. Carl's um, when Mr. Carl applied for permission to appeal from the judge, um, one of the points he made in his grounds was that there were lots of findings of fraud in the judgment and such like, um, and that all of that was relevant and went into the mix as regards standing to, to sue. I just want to turn up a point um, in the judge's reasons for refusing permission to appeal, which really goes to the judge's interpretation of his own judgment. Um, but in my submission, it's relevant. And it should be at tab yes, B65. three of the core bundle, my lord. Which paragraph? Um, so um, it, it's, it's addressed actually in, apologies my lord, it's actually addressed in the context of part 36. Um, it's paragraph 18 at page B68. Thank you. Um, Mr. Cousins had made submissions to appeal the application of part 36, and he made these sort of points to say that the, uh, the behaviour of GFL was egregious, and therefore the judge shouldn't have um, exercised its discretion to visit the cost consequences of failing to beat a part 36 offer upon, the, upon Mr. Carl. So what's the part of this you draw attention to? I just draw your attention to what's said by the judge at paragraph 18a. Thank There's you. no plea of allegation of fraud, nor was any finding of fraud made. So that's the judge's own interpretation of his judgment. And then when one comes to the consequentials judgment itself, which is the uh, final tab of the supplementary bundle, Um, and if I could just take my order to uh, tab F20, page F146. The judge recites a submission um, that he shouldn't exercise his discretion at paragraph 11, um, given the behaviour of GFL that was advanced by um, Mr Cousins in the consequentials hearing. And over the page at paragraph 15, right, paragraph 15. So in effect, the judge found it was a score draw. Exactly, my judge, my, my, my lord. Uh, paragraph 15. He says, "I accepted some of Mr. Carl's evidence. I didn't accept others. I accepted some of Mr. Piskin's evidence. I didn't accept others." He doesn't. There's none of these. The tone of the judgment just doesn't lend itself to this analysis, whereby. GFL was some sort of celebrated fraudster that was conniving against Mr. Carl. It's just not there. And then at paragraph 17, he notes that this just isn't this extreme sort of case. He refers to um, a case called Solomon, which was to do with circumstances where you can, um, you know, when, when a claimant isn't, in, when a party that beats its offer isn't entitled to the court, court part 36 consequences when it's acted fraudulently. And he says this just isn't that sort of case. Um, where people have been found involved in fraudulent activity, the fraudulent activity has had significant bearing on the trial, 
and significant bearing on the claim that they themselves are advancing. So when one looks really at how the judge interpreted this, it's, it's just not borne out in his view, the points I'm trying to make. In any event, I say as a matter of law, it's not relevant to the interpretation of the agreement. We always have that. Right. So is um, that it on um, that issue? Yes, my lord. Right, so now anything in reply on the cross appeal? Very briefly, my lord. Um, the first point is that my own friend says this isn't just a question of applying English law to this agreement and considering whether property might have passed. Well, I can see that Mr. Carl might want to advance a case in another jurisdiction, but it, there, was, there was no, foreign law was never pleaded, um, and in those circumstances, the court could proceed on the basis that foreign law is the same as English law, when no one who's alleging foreign law has made any attempt to plead and prove foreign law. So you do just need, you can just adopt the same analysis. Yes, but if one, if one doesn't know whether gearboxes, it's a bit difficult to start pleading in, in different general, provisions Lord. of foreign law. Yes, I, I accept that, but then it just, and I, I do accept that, my Lord. Right. Um, the second point, in the context of the cross-appeal, the learned friend made some submissions in respect of specific performance, but the cross-appeal doesn't concern specific performance, um, so I'm not going to address those. Um, it concerns delivery up under the 1977 Act. Then, finally, my learned friend made the point that he was simply going to rely on the points that he made in his written submissions with regard to ex terpi causa, um, and effectively, therefore, there being uh, no entitlement to the remedy of delivery up as a result. Um, how it's put in his written submissions is essentially that because of the way in which GFL acted, allegedly fraudulently, um, it isn't entitled to it, it isn't entitled to an order for delivery up of the gearbox. In his written submissions, it doesn't really go much further than that. So there isn't engagement with the three-stage Patel test that's recently been considered by the Supreme Court in the Stoffel judgment um, towards the back end of last year. In, in my submission, if one's going to consider an ex terpe causa point, one really needs to go through those three stages and weigh up um, the appropriateness of denying the remedy pursuant to that analysis. So in those circumstances, it's difficult for me to address you further on it. Um, safe to say that insofar as there was any um, quote-unquote wrongdoing in the broad sense by GFL, it certainly wasn't operative. You can see that from paragraphs 135 and 136 of the judgment. Um, mm -hmm. And when one normally gets to the stage two of the Patel test, considering countervailing public policy considerations, in the context of the cross appeal, this would be effectively to deny a right that is premised on ownership of property. This isn't a case where one would be um, and now allowing a wrongdoer to profit because there's no profit from the turnover of the gearbox. It was established on the evidence at trial that all GFL wants to do is to give the gearbox to the end buyer. It, it didn't even say at trial that it was under a contractual obligation to do so. It was to enhance its reputation and make the gearbox whole. So the countervailing public policy outweighs any um, uh, consideration that should be given to the wrongdoing itself, which in, its, in, in turn is not operative. And then when one gets to the third stage of Patel, um, applying the Supreme Court's decision in Stoffel, one doesn't even need to go to stage three unless, having done the stage one and stage two analysis, one's leaning towards denying the claim. But when one gets to stage three, 
really for the same sort of reasons, it would be entirely disproportionate to deny a claim for delivery up under the 1977 Act, particularly in circumstances where there's not going to be any profit from wrongdoing as a result. But in circumstances where the, the, um, the appellant's case isn't really presented in the three-stage analysis which is required when making an ex-terpe counsel submission, I, I can't really go any further than that, my lord. So where we've arrived at is that um, if you get the gearbox, whether for um, at a price or not, um, from what we've seen, there's nothing that obliges you to pass it on. No. I, no. It, was, it was never our case that, that there was, my lord. No, I understand that. I mean, I mean meaning that um, you enter into a negotiation with the owner of the car in order to see whether it's appropriate to reunite them. Well, um, my lord, uh, in cross-examination at trial, uh, Mr. Cousins asked Mr. Fiskin about this. Yes. And Mr. Fiskin effectively said, no, I'm just going to give it to him. And much was made of that in closing submissions. And the judge recognises that in the judgment that GFL is just going to give this to the end buyer. You, you, my lord's quite right that there's no contractual obligation to do so. There's Where no... in the judgment is, is that recorded? Is it simply a recording of Mr. Fiskin's evidence or... Um, it may not be a report of Mr. Peskin's cross-examination is in the bundle. I could take you to it first. Sorry, is it in the judgment? Um, the, what is recorded in the judgment um, is that GFL is going to give it to the end buyer. That's in the specific performance section. Paragraphs 186 and 187, my lord. Um, at paragraph 186, he talks about reuniting the property. And again, and at 186, he talks about how that will enhance the claimant's reputation as a dealer in the market. He makes the same point at 187 in the penultimate sentence. So the judge's understanding uh, of the circumstances that led him to order specific performance was that in effect um, your client was going to pass it on to the owner. Um, but he, 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 even though not casting any doubt upon that, um, but there is no such provision in his order? No. Is there any reason there shouldn't be? Um, well, the, the order works. It, well, uh, the order gives... You may a, want to look behind you. We would object. There'd be no objection to that, my lord. Um, right. In circumstances where the order is designed to actually just give effect to contractual obligations, it probably wouldn't be appropriate in the order, but there would be no objection to including terms to that effect. Yes, well I can see as, as sabres haven't stopped rattling um, in this case that um, there might be some value in some ghosts being laid to rest. Forgive me for mixing my metaphors. All right. Yes. Anything else on the cross appeal? If I I um, might turn my head for one minute. Of course. This isn't directly responsive to my learned friend's submissions in the cross appeal, my lord, but more to the point that my learned friend made the first time about section 9 of the appellant's notice. 
Well, I think that was raised by my, by my Lord after you'd sat down, so I think you're entitled to say something about it. Um, it it's only really this, my Lord. This is the first time that we've heard that Mr. Carl is now suggesting that the order below not be set aside, um, and that now he is willing to let GFL retain the gearbox, therefore undermining at least my primary understanding of the basis for the appeal in the first place. Um, so we'd like to note that. And the, the second point in connection is that this leaves us a little bit in the dark as regards what Mr. Carl's case is on title to sue. Because my learned friend said that um, the appeal should be allowed for all of the grounds in respect to which relief was given, which includes issue one on standing to sue. But if there's no relief sought to set aside the order for specific performance. I, I struggle to see how that works in practice. Inconsistent case. Yes, my lord. Yes. Anything else? No, my lord. Thank you very much, Mr. Clark. Right. Well, can we thank you both and those who um, support you for um, the preparation of the appeal and for um, your cooperation in making sure that we've managed to complete it within the, the day, which seems like a fair time estimate, as so it has proved. Um, so um, thank you for that. We'll, of course, consider our judgments and let you have them as soon as we can. Um, you know the procedures, but um, in, 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 in essence, um, we will have the opportunity to make editorial corrections and to correct any factual errors. We will then hand down the judgments at a hearing which will almost certainly not be attended, and then consequential matters should be dealt with in writing, and we will um, seek to deal with those without convening a further hearing. Um, are there any other matters that um, Council would wish to raise? My Lord, my Lady? No. Thank you all very much indeed. All right.